Hello, uh, it's John for Through the Eyes of George, and today I'd like to talk to you about the King James Bible and George Washington. We're going to look at a few uh, letters and correspondence from George Washington and uh, some excerpts from some George Washington biographies. And I'd like to say that George uh, would want people to live a good, moral, virtuous life any way that they can get it, whether that's through believing in some type of belief system, whatever that is, or through Christianity, or just being a good, moral-centered, virtuous person. There are a lot of virtuous people um, who don't believe in God, and George would be okay with that. We're going to look at a quote from George Washington at the end of this um, video about that. So thank you for watching this video. Uh, go to my YouTube channel, Through the Eyes of George, or my website, uh, POTUS1.com. And don't forget to click subscribe and give it a thumbs up or click the notification bell. Thank you very much. First, I'd like to start out and do a short history of how the King James Bible was made and then go into... Uh, George Washington's involvement with the King James Bible. One question I have for you is, what is your standard? What is your foundation for making decisions? What do you fall back on for your good character? George Washington's standard was the King James Bible. If your standard is something else, some other godly belief system, whether that's Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Taoism, or just having a good, virtuous uh, character, George Washington would be okay with any of those. And we'll get into that later. The point is, is that you have a good moral character. Now, King James in 1603 became the King of England. He also was the King of Scotland. The only Bibles that were available were the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible. Uh, and this is around the time of uh, the mid to late 1500s. So after King James is King of England in 1604, um, he had a meeting to talk about various things, and uh, one of the things that was suggested to King James was to make a new Bible. And James said, ha, huh, that's probably a good idea. Let's do it. So what he did is he appointed Robert, Robert Cecil, uh, S-E-C-I-L, uh, over the organization of the translators and the completion of this project. Robert Cecil. And uh, Lancelot Andrews was the head translator of this project. Greg Abbott was uh, another translator. And there, there was 54 people in this uh, project. And they were broken up into six committees each of these committees took a chunk of the Bible and translated, translated it. Um, the New Testament being Greek and the Old Testament being Hebrew. Uh, these people, these people took the these committees took uh, what they were uh, translating uh, and. Uh, when they were done, they gave it to another committee, then gave it to King James. And it was uh, approved through hearing, not by um, what it looked like, uh, because they wanted it to sound good. And these people knew um, that they were not the author of the Bible, but that they were just translators. They were involved in the everyday life. Um, they weren't hiding away, tucked away in some ivory tower, some secret place. Um, but they were translating. And one thing I really uh, love about the King James Bible is that, uh, in my 
uh, view. It is a, one of the most scholarly Bibles um, because it has the italicies in uh, the text. Excuse me. It has the italicies in the text. And also, these uh, committees, these six committees who are translating, had to abide by 14 rules um, for translation. Now, in 1631, um, there was, uh, after the Bible, or the King James Bible was finished, it was finished in 1610 and 1611, it was available to the public. 1631, there was so many tra uh, errors in, um, in uh, translating, uh, like to words totally missing, and this version was called the Wicked Bible. In 1618 and 1690, we have uh, fires that happened, and a lot of the history of the King James Bible, uh, of how it was made, was kind of lost. And two of the Bible, uh, uh, two of the books, I mean, two of the books that uh, about the King James Bible that I found the most information on was this book here uh, by Adam uh, Nick Lawson, and... Uh, it's called uh, God's Secretaries, The Making of the King James Bible. And then this book here called uh, How We Got the Bible by Neil Lightfoot. So this is God's Secretaries and this is How We Got the Bible. Two very good books on the making of the King James Bible. Now, like I said before at the beginning is... George Washington's standard was the King James Bible. It was the virtue and the character he was taught as a young man. That's why people liked him so much, because he exuded the things that uh, they wanted most for themselves. That is why he is so important today as uh, how important he was back then. He exuded the best of humanity through all the flaws that he had. And a quote from George Washington is uh, on December 5th, 1790, about uh, virtue and morality. And it says, A good moral character is first essential in a man or in a person. It is therefore highly important that you should endeavor to be not only learned, or educated, but virtuous. This was to George Steptoe Washington, from George Washington. So George Washington understood to have a good moral character, or to have good character, you had to have some kind of education, or to be learned, and to have some kind of virtue, to have that good character. And George Washington was a Freemason, and the Freemasons used the uh, Masonic Bible, which uh, predominantly was the King James Version. And uh, for this good character, you know, you can see how much of uh, God's Word was inside of George Washington. How much he studied it. Second Timothy two fifteen says, "Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman." Uh, not being ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. Uh, you can see how much of this was inside of George Washington, how much he hid it in his heart, like it says in Psalms, because he regularly would uh, quote the King James Version Bible in many of his letters and correspondence, uh, just putting them through there, sprinkling them through, his letters. Um, some of them were idioms, some of it was figures of speech uh, of the King James Bible. And one of the most famous uh, figures of speech that George Washington used was from uh, uh, Kings and from the book of Micah. 
So I will read these portions from this book here. Oops. From this book here, Martha Washington in American Life by uh, Patricia Brady, um, about these uh, idioms and figures of speech that George Washington loved so much. And this is on page 213. It says, Martha and George Washington, familiar, familiar as they were with the King James Version of the Bible, two verses were especially potent symbols for their retirement and often appeared in their correspondence. The book of First Kings described a sort of earthly paradise under the wise and powerful rule of King Solomon. And it says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. First Kings 4.25 The book of Micah prophesied, a day when there would be no more war, and men would beat their swords into plowshares. In the next verse that peace was described as, But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make him afraid. That is Micah chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Excuse me. So, that is some of the uh, words and figures of speech idioms that George Washington would use in his letters, and he used many of them. And all of my sources in this video, I'll put in the description below. So, remember, George Washington, he attended church services regularly throughout his time before, during, and after his presidency. Um, during his first term in office, in his uh, Southern tour, um, T.H. Bream, uh, George Washington's journey, or Washington's journey, about the tours that George Washington took of the New England tour and the Southern tour, we see that George Washington... Uh, met in churches because it was commonly known in the town um, where people met for various things. And it was a very good space, very large space to meet. George Washington also um, had many sermons that were sent to him just to see if he would like them. Many uh, things about God's Word sent to him. So he had a, a plethora, a myriad of information about God's Word coming to him. And he absolutely loved God. He loved the Bible. He prayed fervently all the time, every, all, weekly, daily, throughout his life. And George Washington understood first and foremost that God gave us free will and at times will intercede in our lives in what we would call miracles or phenomena. But we just don't wait around for these miracles or these phenomena. We make stuff happen. George Washington didn't wait around thinking, Oh, what should I do? I don't know. He did what he knew uh, he was supposed to do as a soldier, as a husband, um, as the father of this country. Uh, he just didn't wait around for God to tell him what to do. Like many Christians today, I need a billboard sign. I need God to tell me every step of the way. No, that's not what George Washington would do. He would do. You know, the world is in desperate need of your life and ability. And if we're just sitting around waiting for things to happen for us, then we're not helping and doing what we're called to do. If God's Word says that you are more than a conqueror through every situation in Romans 8, if God's Word says that we are His workmanship or His masterpiece uh, in Ephesians 2.10, then we are. God, if we believe that God's Word, if we are what God's Word says we are, then we are. It doesn't matter, and that goes for any belief system that you believe in, um, whatever moral compass or godly lifestyle. And this is this whole video is in the context of godly lifestyle. Um, and you take the whole word of God. You don't nitpick and say, I only want to 
adhere to this. And remember that we're not perfect. George Washington was not perfect. There's no president alive today or back in George Washington's time and all the way in the future that will ever be perfect. But remember that quote, endeavor to not only be learned but virtuous, to at least try to be educated in some kind of way and to be virtuous. And remember, George Washington understood that not everybody is going to, that not everybody is uh, going to want to have a godly lifestyle, but that godly principles are important. And in this book here, by Michael and Jana Novak, Washington's God, we see that in George Washington's farewell address. On page 171, it says, Of all the dispensations and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, in the sense of religious obligation, desert the oaths, which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. So George Washington understood that for a country uh, to prevail, it had to have biblical principles. It didn't have to have um, the federal government mandate religion on its people. Uh, our First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, some people like to say that there is a wall of separation of church and state. The Constitution doesn't say that. That phrase, that wall, is from a letter uh, from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists in 1803. That phrase is, or in, in 1802, I'm sorry, uh, that phrase is not in the Constitution. And I'll put all of my sources about everything in the description below. So, remember that George Washington's standard, in closing, George Washington's standard was the King James Bible. He exuded the virtuous principles of morality and the education that he did have, because he never went to a university, um, through practicing and learning that he's human and that it's okay to make mistakes and to keep going and to not wait for things to happen, but to do them. This virtue, uh, this virtuousness, this morality gave him consistency and a foundation to go back to when he did make mistakes. And I implore you, all of you watching this video to remember that having a standard is a good thing. It doesn't have to be the King James Bible. It can be whatever you want it to be because that's what George Washington um, would say. To have some kind of morality, some kind of good character, to have a foundation for living. So thank you for watching this video. Um, don't forget to uh, click subscribe, click the notification bell, give it a thumbs up, and uh, you're awesome, and I'll talk to you later. Peace.